And there was a man who they called the captain of the feast. And this captain of the feast would go around and check everyone and say, do you have oil? Do you have, do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Word of God? And if they didn't have any oil, or if they were not clothed in white, they were not allowed into the marriage feast. And they would bind them hand and foot. When he went over there, it would be 12 midnight. We're talking about 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. 1 to 2 in the morning. That was a frightening time during the first century to the Jews. They didn't have street lights. They didn't have policemen walking up and down. You got in your house. You went to bed at sundown because you got up early. And you didn't go out in the streets. Whenever the Bible speaks of thieves break through the walls and steal, their walls were made out of brick or burnt brick or something like adobe. And a thief would just simply get some kind of pick and pick through and steal. Thieves break through and steal. They would take anyone who did not have the marriage robe on. And they would take them, bind them hand and foot, and cast them out into the streets. No street lights. Thieves and robbers were out there. And they, they called that outer darkness. Now that's, you say, what was the marriage with the Jews? I'm going to say something, and this is not meant to be crude. This is what they did. They had inside the house what they called the hoopa. There was a room here. It had the hoopa, H-U-P-P-A. The hoopa was the marriage canopy bed. They would go there. They had made their vows at the beginning of the betrothal. They would go into this room and they would perform the sex act. That was a holy, righteous, godly thing among the Jews. Should be among Christians. They would take the blood of the hymen. They would take it and put it on a cloth and pass it out. And they would cheer because she was a virgin. She was a picture of Israel. Now that's the true marriage vow. Then the marriage was consummated. And they would come out and everyone would congratulate them and hug them and love them. There was no laughing at this. This was not like someone would do in America. This is a holy, righteous God. It's the most holy thing to marry two believers that you can be involved in when you're talking about ceremonies for the Lord because it is a picture of Christ and the church. That's why we see throughout Scripture where God speaks of choosing his wife she was chosen, bought and paid for. She didn't know who he was until he came and introduced himself to her and she was willing. You say, what if something happened during this time and she could not be... White was a picture of righteousness. That was a picture of, that was a picture of purity. What if she wasn't pure somewhere and she had committed some kind of indiscretion? Maybe cursed. The bridegroom had it in his power to forgive her. And of course, if she was truly committed to him and bought and given to him, and she had the mind to be, she had been given a mind by her parents. We've been given a mind by God to believe God. And when she was given that mind, she would be repentant and he would forgive her. Just like God forgives us. We repent, He forgives us, and we're clothed in white when we are taken out. And the, and the white is the righteousness of the saints. And we know what that is. Let me read to you. This is not like any wedding anybody hears. Let me read to you here in, in, in Matthew, the seventh, excuse me, Revelation, the seventh chapter. I've never really done a wedding like this before, but I believe this is what we need to do. And we need to impart to people what the church is about, what the wife and the bride is about. Over here in Revelation 7, we see the scripture speaking about 
a mass of people around the throne of God, giving praises to him. After this I beheld in lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. A reference to the white robes of the wife when she's taken out. One day Jesus will come. He will, will, he will come out and, and he will come in the air, as fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians says. And, and we're, not to be a, a, we're not to be worried concerning these things of Christ and those that are asleep. The scripture says, even so, those that believe in Jesus will God bring, those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, coming from his Father's house to get us. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not go before those that are asleep but we shall be caught up together with them, the dead in Christ, who are part of the church, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The wife and the husband is everything about the second coming in the end of time, because we're the wife, and he's coming for us. He goes on to say, And they stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. This is a picture of us praising God in eternity. At this marriage, men from every nation were clothed in white robes. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes? This is the very essence of a marriage, white robes. And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These in the white robes are those, or they which came out of great tribulation and have made their robes and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of Christ. Robes are made white in the blood. A blood baptism in the first century was a martyrdom. We are martyred for telling the truth. Jesus tells the apostles, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Can you be clothed in white? Without the white robes, without death to self, without a daily cross, God is going to see to it that his wife takes their cross and die daily. He's going to write his word in our hearts. We are the wife. We are the bride. We will be the bride when he takes us out. And he's going to close us, clothe us with a blood baptism. We here know that baptize doesn't mean to dip in water. It's the word baptizo. Baptizo and babto is what the word comes from. It means to cover with a stain or dye. That has to do with the wife. Without a blood baptism, without a blood baptism, you're not going to heaven when you die. You can't be in the wife. You can't be clothed in white. You're not permitted to go to the house of the Father. And who is it clothes us? Christ clothes us. He's, washed, he's done the washing. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood there in Revelation 1 and 6. He did the washing. We didn't. That shows the sovereignty of God, predestination, whom he did foreknow, the people he foreknew, his wife that he foreknew, he predestined to conform and be like Jesus and wear these robes of white. That's what we are preordained for. And that's what the wife is. Let me give you another verse here in Revelation 19. Revelation 19. This is right before Jesus comes back on a white horse with eyes as a flame of fire. Right before it, it says... Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And without it, you're not in the wife, the church. You're not going to be taken out. Somewhere in the life of every man, we have to be dying daily. We have to be denying self. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross 
daily and die daily and go through a blood baptism and put on the white robes and follow me. During a contract, when the Jews had a contract, there would be an article of clothing in the first century passed from one to the other. From the contracting party. Well, the scripture says, when he says, this cup is the New Testament, a new contract in my blood, we drink the blood of Christ, but what we drink is we drink a blood baptism, we drink of truth. And a blood baptism being a martyrdom, that's the white robes of the saints. And without that, men don't know God. There has to be a daily cross, there must be self-denial, and a daily cross comes by telling people truth and them crucifying for us. So when those of us here at Grace and Truth, when we see and know these things, know that you're simply putting on the clothing that's been given you to wear when men, when they persecute you. The Bible says, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, and that's not water, have put on Christ. The word put on is the word in duo. It means to sink into clothing. This is what the church, this is what marriage is about. It's about Christ in the church, the robes of white, the purity of the church, death to self, daily cross, self-denial. That's what it's about. That's what predestination is about. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. His wife. And we're going to be clothed in white, and there is no doubt we're going to conform. We're predestined to conform to his likeness, death to self, and put on the robes of righteousness. Anyone who doesn't do that doesn't know God. They're not going to heaven. They're not a part of the church. It doesn't matter how many churches they go to, because these are not churches. You can't call a building out to meet the Lord, can you? You can't do that. The church is the wife. And this is Jason's church he's calling her out to be with him so he can protect her that's what all these verses are about when we're talking about predestination that's what the the five wise and five foolish virgins remember five of the virgins they they go to the house of the bridegroom and they says you can't come in you don't have any oil in your lamp you have no truth and the ones that had the truth or had the oil, they went to be with the bridegroom's father. Now, let me say a couple of more things here. Even when Jesus was, when Jesus was before Pilate there in John 19, Jesus wasn't being rebellious when he would not argue with Pilate. When Pilate was saying, don't you know I've got the power to release you? He said, you don't have any power except to be given you of my Father which is in heaven. And Jesus wouldn't talk to him. If Jesus had argued with him, he would have been arguing about the price he had to pay for his wife. That's what he'd been arguing about. He, he wasn't going to do that. He knew the price. The price was paid. And that's why he said to the Pharisees in John 10, they said, tell us plainly if you're the Christ. He said, you will not believe because you're not of my sheep. You're not of my wife. Go away from me. My sheep or my wife hears my voice. They know me. They follow me. And I give my wife that was bought and paid for before the world began. I give her eternal life. No one else. So he died for his wife, the church. No one else. The man in hell is dying for his own sin. <laughs> Jesus submits to his father's will. There was no invitation in this. She was bought, paid for, introduced. It was, it was set. That's the way it was. And we are bought and paid for. And if God has bought us and given us to Christ, he's going to put us, he's going to put truth in our hearts. That's what he's going to do. And he's going to cause us to want to live righteously. This is not a choice a man makes. It's something that God makes, puts the truth in our hearts. We're his wife. He bought us and paid for us. That is the story of predestination. It's the story of righteousness. It's the story of the white robes. And without righteousness in our lives, you say,